I'm sure Eric has had some experience with. Eric, have you used it and what is it like? Uh, yeah, I have actually used it a couple of times. Um, and uh, so it's, it's actually very cool. So it's pretty similar to, um, this is a very drastic uh, simplification, but think of noise canceling. Um, and uh, that's perception is subwoofer sends out information we've got different positions in the room they're all different phases they're all different amplitudes um and what you're doing is just changing the arrival time uh and helping other subwoofers supplement that um, so it works quite well mm. um i think it's you know one of those kind of things that is a big improvement um and uh we've had some great experiences with it i think you do have to have some intelligence about the settings um you can be and i know it's uh actually evolved and gotten a lot better as uh from the first couple of times that we used it as well we did it a couple of shows and demos um and it works much better within specific limits not going too high in frequency um it works you know, up to 150, maybe even 200 Hertz, but just because it works doesn't mean it sounds great. Yeah. Um, at that, at those settings. Um, and what I found a, a long time ago is if you set it too high, one, you're now, uh, sharing the load between maybe your mains and even surrounds. And then you start localizing sounds that shouldn't be in speakers in different positions of the room. Hmm. Um, and you can actually degrade you may have great performance and great flat frequency response throughout the room, uh, but you doesn't necessarily mean it sounds good. Um, and so that's kind of with the, the caveats of that, it, yeah. it works great. It really does what it, what it says it, it, it can do. Um, so yeah, it's a pretty cool technology. Um, you just have to be careful in settings. How, how do you think it stands up to a waveform? It's very, very different from my perspective. It's been a long time since I've A, B them or been where you've done one versus the other. Um, you know, the disadvantage of waveforming is more workers. Um, yeah. The advantage is that you truly remove the room. You basically take a standing uh, wave in a room and you make it a traveling wave. So you take out all the interactions with the room itself. Um, you know, and theoretically it's perfect, but obviously it's never perfect. Um, that absorption, the front wave emits a, uh, a wave front, the back room subwoofers absorb that energy. So it's not reflected back. If it's not reflected back. You can't have a standing wave. Um, so, you know, the aspects of now you put stuff in a room and risers and all that, it, it's never absolutely perfect. Um, but from that aspect, it works pretty good. The negative is you got double the amount of subwoofers. Yeah. So from a cost perspective, it can be kind of tough. Um, but now there's cylindrical waveform, waveforming. There's some other solutions that they're coming up with that are, um, again, a little bit of a sacrifice. Um, but generally, it takes the the you can't take the ceiling mode out then. So halfway through the height of the room mm. would be a null. Um, depending on the height of where you're sitting though, um, generally you're not sitting at that, your head isn't quite at that position, Yeah, but it would be the main mode of, of, uh, one single null instead of, you know, eight or 10 nulls throughout the bandwidth that you generally deal with when we, uh, deal with room modes. So. Do you think, do you think if they have a system where they have waveforming plus they add in your capable speakers, kind of like art into the mix that would. That would rectify that. Oh, theoretically, probably <laughs> <laughs> gets kind of crazy because then you're going to start fighting what you're doing with waveforming. Mm, so yeah, those true. two technologies are actually going to start uh, combating each other. You're you're you have a traveling wave um, that is now being affected by other speakers in a room from multiple positions. Um, there's probably a logical or intelligent way to do it. Um, you know, someone way smarter than me and signal processing, um, depending on what you might do and at what frequencies and where you stop being a traveling wave and which frequencies you start to, uh, 
uh, use an art technique. Uh, technique. Right. So when you say art, like if it's not calibrated correctly, your settings aren't correct, you can start to localize. Is it just the the lower frequencies that you localize, or is it actual con like you know stuff in the in the mix of content? Yeah, it's in the upper bands. So when you start saying I'm, uh, you're sending signal from let's say 100 hertz or 150 hertz or something like that and uh you start saying well i want to cancel that signal uh, from another surround or another main to help uh, make sure that they sum perfectly at the listening position um, and not you're not hearing a, uh, a node uh, anti-node then uh you're starting to now have a signal that was in your right speaker it's now for coming from the left mm. speaker um, you know, and that's not where it should be. It's not where it should be coming from as a, a, a technique of, you know, object oriented recording, right? Where is it at spatially in space? Um, that was quite a few years ago, last time that I had used it in a demo. So there may be some more improvements in, in uh, signal processing that they've done since then. And then there's also probably that uh, uh, I'm pretty sure they've kind of set the limit or found the sweet spot when you talk to Storm Audio or someone else from Dirac of uh, where they want those settings to be to get those, you know, the best settings, the best performance, right? So, so is your uh, your preferred calibration technique, would it be art or waveform? Uh, actually, I don't know. Um, I have used them, I think, in a smaller room more cost effective scenario mm -hmm. art is a great great performance um you know that that's really a really cool affordable way to get a great bass throughout the space um i don't really have a strong preference for either one um we use waveforming quite often um from some recent shows because they're most one of our most recent partners so i've got the most recent experience with them and a few demo rooms, but uh, both are great performances. I've never used it in, a, actually I have, at M-Wave we used it in a really large room. Um, and it worked really well in that perspective. So, yeah. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to try it out very soon. Have you had the chance to do kind of an AB or in your, your room do both? I haven't, I haven't, uh, I think up till now, only Storm had the exclusive on it. Yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah, so I might have to get like an AV-10 or something in to, to try it out. Yeah, yeah. It just sucks because it's kind of like I got all these speakers in there. I got like two dozen speakers in there, and I know the AV-10 doesn't do that many. So Yeah, so and I think, think, you know, great technologies like both of them are is that there's always a limitation in performance of a loudspeaker, right? And yeah. And you're, you're asking more out of a woofer in both scenarios. Um, but I don't think it's that different than standard base management. You know, when we're, yeah. we have standard base, base management and doing a really good calibration is hard. You know, we, the, a lot of systems that we use have these auto calibrations, you know, they, oh, I, I, you know, set up my little microphone. I measured four subwoofers and auto calibration does some stuff and now it's great. Right. Yeah. Well, most of the time we're probably leaving a lot, a lot of performance on the table. Yeah. Um, and chasing a perfectly flat curve doesn't mean it sounds great. Yeah. Um, I've seen a lot of people, you know, oh, I PQ'd this down t 10 dB for these peaks. So it was equal with a no, well, you just threw away 10 dB of yeah. performance. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, so chasing the perfect flat curve can, and, and we've, I've heard perfectly flat curves and sometimes you lose the impact, right? Cause they're not summing in a perfect phase alignment. What a lot of my really high end calibrators do is even with trend off with storm doesn't really matter whether they, they come upon an AVR or whatever they are matching phase with the subwoofers first. Mm -hmm. So, time and phase alignment. So what happens in that scenario then when you start adding the subwoofers in is you remove a lot of the limitations of what an algorithm and a processor is doing. It's, it's taking that data, the amplitude and the phase measurements. It's making lots of assumptions in the background. 
we don't know what those assumptions are, right? It's base management being controlled by whatever processor. A lot of those assumptions may be just dead, you know, dead wrong, or maybe it was a poor measurement. It was noisy in the background. It was, you know, very, uh, there was lots of reflections and noise going on in the room from the <laughs> walls rattling, etc. Yeah, And it's picking up that in the signal and it starts making assumptions that maybe are incorrect or maybe not the greatest data. Um, and then your base management is, you know, trying to make up for a lot of problems and maybe they're not real problems. And uh, so that performance is, you know, not necessarily great at that point in time. Um, taking like huge peaks and just P and queuing them down a little bit. I mean, mm -hmm. EQ actually improves decay. Um, even though it's just plain old EQ, it does, and you know there are true sound quality benefits to taking down a resonance and some of that decay. So those decisions that the processor processor has to make are a lot less now. Therefore, the end result is a lot better. So those are some great techniques. Uh -huh.